Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Alejandro, or Alex, that's a simple way of saying. Uh, first thing, feel free to move forward. This pretends to be, so anyone, don't be shy, come here, this, this is the moment to move around, stretch your legs, it's been a long day probably. Um, this is meant to be a, a talk where we discuss, so it's pretty open. Um, it's pretty opinionated, so you might have an opinion that is different, and that's great. This is what this is meant for. Uh, I promise to be sure I should, or I must. Uh, let me put this here. I'm not cloning screens. So, screen settings. Give me a minute, please. Readable, should be good. Okay, good. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, this talk is about microservice and architecture and patterns. So it's about how we can move from a monolith uh, to microservice, what problems comes with that, and what solutions are already there to solve these problems. So my first question is, uh, who in the audience is a developer, or develops, or codes? Okay, cool. The rest are designers. PMs? Students. Students, that's good. Uh, any student that can code is a developer. Uh, cool. Uh, who does uh, backend or works with backend or actually has to deal with a backend? Even if you're a front end, you have to deal with a backend. Um, cool. So feel free to stop me. Feel free to say, I don't believe that. That's a lie because it's possible. Okay? Um, this talk, it's about a little bit that. So about me, I'm Alejandro Vidal Rodriguez, I'm from Spain, that's why this super Spanish name. I work in Trovascale, I'm the director of engineering, and we're hiring. So if you're interested, please go check our website, in the next month we'll open a few positions. Uh, what is the agenda? So we're going to talk about the motivation, about microservices, some requisites, like you don't want to jump into this, like saying like microservice, like great. Our whole company is going for it. You have to be ready. Like if you take a jump, it's a kind of a leap of faith. So you might not make it to the other side. Uh, we're going to talk about inter-process communication. So how things talk between each other, how now they used to, and how they do it in a microservice world. We're going to talk about transaction and sagas. This is something that is used in many languages, so it's useful for other things, but it's very important in the distributed world. Uh, event sourcing, like if we all talk with messages, we have to find a way to actually make this happen and work. And then querying data. There are many more topics, but I try to keep it short on the time I was given. But let's see. So I should have till 4.30 or less. Cool. So this all starts with an interview. You go to an interview. You make it. You say the right words. You say microservice, distributed databases, scalability. They, they buy and they say, you're great. You're in. So you have a job, uh, they give you a job of a tech lead position at a company that delivers uh, food to people. No, actually I wouldn't say toys, just to keep it uh, secret. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm going to go away. Uh, what is a tech? So at food to go they have been developing their system in a big system and a big solution. So it, it, it actually turns like something like this that you move around. Uh, we're going to call it Jella Toys. So we're going to sell toys instead of food. And this is the monolith, so you, you will call it. And then you go to the meeting. Uh, it's your first day, you go there, and the people look at you like, oh, this is exciting. And you say, well, we can try to make a smaller service, divide our monolith, and everything's going to be amazing. And people look at you and say, yes, we're going for it. It's, it's, it's very good. Yeah, that's, that's what we need. So let's do a poll, a very small poll. Who thinks that microservices are better than monoliths? Someone? Someone think? Okay, no, okay. Who thinks that monoliths are better than microservices? Come on, you have to choose. <laughs> okay, I like that, I like that. Who thinks it, it depends? You have to choose one of these three, that's it. So you have to go for one of these. So uh, usually more people buy in and they say that microservices are the solution for everything. Um, but monoliths have a lot of pros. They have some cons, they have a lot of pros. 
Uh, they're simple to develop. It's one thing, you go in, you check out the code, you can see everything. They're easy to make radical changes across the whole system. Because if you change something here, your, probably your compiler eventually will say, well, you change this, this doesn't work, so you know. It's a straightforward to test, kind of. Uh, but everything is in one place, so you can see, test things, they, they go together. Straightforward to deploy. Uh, I know this sounds counterintuitive, but you only take one thing, even if it's super big, you put it in the cloud, and there it is. Uh, they're easy to scale. Uh, but I heard, you probably heard, like microservices are, that's, that's why we probably do microservices, no? Because it, everybody told us that monoliths are not easy to scale. Well, they are, but they can only be scaled horizontally. So I have one server, supports 10,000 users. I have 20,000 users, what do I do? I put another one. Super simple, everybody can do the math. I'm gonna put three, just in case. So they do scale, and they scale simply. They have limitations. Inter-process communication speed is the best because they talk inside one room. Like if I want to talk with any of you in the room, it's quite fast. If we are microservices and you go to different rooms in different cities, well, I have to call you, I have to send you a message, it will take time to go and back. And that is the main difference. It has cons, of course, resource management or how to scale. Like if you have a big monolith and a part of your monolith, which is the one that talks about uh, let's say the stock of the toys it takes a lot of memory actually it tends to crash but actually your selling part is super fast it doesn't need that memory and it's super good well the problem is that every time you scale your system if the stocking part fails your selling part also fails and that is the problem with this scalability the plumbing gets harder I, I need to say this many times it gets really hard it gets horrible hard it gets painful hard because you have now a lot of, uh, so it's, it's so big then you put it, and then you need these machines, and you don't even know like, why it doesn't work. Oh, my database is not there. I cannot discover it. I hard coded basically all the URLs. And it's very, it, it usually tends to be coupled because it's so big that it's. Uh, okay, I should have any trolley shit come. Oh, there you go. Um, so it, it gets coupled. What does it mean? Like, if you have one piece of your monolith that you want to do, like what I said in Go. You have to get the buy-in from the company to move everything to go, nobody will do that. But if it's separated into small pieces, they say, no, yeah, this small piece makes sense to be in Go, so do it in Go. But as you said, maybe another piece, you want to do it in Java, and that's fine. Monoliths are very difficult to do that because they tend to be one single tech. Complexity grows beyond what's understandable. It becomes a point where you have a backend, if it happens to anything in the front end, that no human can understand. That's it, it's the reality. It's so big that no one understands it. That's a problem. <laughs> you get a new developer, you go to a company, they show you something, you say, I don't even know where to start. I'm going to change here, something broke there. I don't get it. And this is the main reason to move to, to microservices. You have a system so big, with so many people working on it, that it's becoming impossible to maintain or understand. Then you make it smaller, and you make it smaller teams, and that should be easier or better. But you need to take measures that actually happen. Easy to miss boundaries. So because everything is in the same block, it's so easy to call that class. I, I, we know, there's, everybody says you shouldn't do that and you should keep on your same package and stuff like that, but I'm gonna call it, let's just call it class.method. I'm good. Uh, but that happens. So microservice, they have a lot of pros. Enable continuous delivery and deployment of large systems because you can definitely deploy many things and each of them they have a test and it's so good. Services are small, easily maintained, they usually much, much smaller, so a small team understand them fully, can fix them. They're independently deployable. This is very difficult, but this is the goal. You want to have very small things that you can deploy independently. Independently means independently. Like, they cannot share anything. And one important thing is they don't share the database. Like, if you deploy 20 servers and they use all the same database, basically you don't have microservices. You have services that are tied to a database, and that usually becomes what is called a distributed monolith. We have the cons, of both systems. Um, service are scalable independently. Yes, I have, it's Black Friday. What I want is to scale my selling platform. But I don't want to scale my other things, just that one, but I want to scale that super hard. Uh, Microsoft Secretary enables teams to be autonomous, and this is what we talk. Many people, they need to talk. If we have teams of six people, each of them, they have a microservice, call, and faster. 
They can easily experiment on all new, uh, new technologies. Like a team says, we really want to do it in Go. Great. No, we actually have a lot of math, so we want to do it in Python. Another team says, well, we actually connect with stuff, so we want to do it in Java. Perfect. Everything works. In each thing, you can pull out what's more important. Problems. Cross cutting concerns and responsibilities. It's so easy to say, oh, I got a system, I'm going to divide it in six pieces. And everybody says, well, yeah, selling, buying, uh, I don't know, platform, toys. There, there's usually this service that falls in between two. You don't know if to put it here, put it here. People start fighting. So it's very difficult in the end to divide these things. And it usually should be divided by business cases, business, uh, business logic. You know? Like selling is one easy, clear business logic. But there are other more difficult, and this becomes a problem. We have an example of this later. Um, it has overhead. Before you just call one thing inside, now you have to call the network. So it's going to be slower, and that's very important. Uh, lack of transaction operations, you give up many things. Like you cannot call any more one website, one query, and get a result or transact. You have problems. Uh, Find the right uh, kind of service is challenging. Distributed systems are very complex to dev test and deployment. Now in your monolith, you can put a breakpoint, see what happens. Distributed systems, who knows what happened? You have no idea. A message came, this happened, this other thing called, can you fix this bug? No, I have no idea. Um, deploying features that have multiple servers requires careful coordination. Before you have a monolith, you change six things, you make a new version, deploy it, it works. Microservices, I make 10 changes in 10 services, I need to deploy 10 of them at the same time and coordinate them. The second one to adopt microservice is difficult and this is the harder point. Are we going for it or not? Is that clear so far? Any questions? Any doubts? Any challenges? You can always say, I don't believe that. All right. I think that's incorrect. Okay, well, you saw me. Like, if I'm going too fast, too slow, also tell me. Uh, so, how to migrate to microservices? I like this concept that you have to be this tall to write. You know, you go to a theme park and tell you have to be this tall. If not, you cannot go into this, right? Microservices do have a lot of things. You need to be able to do rapid provisioning, basic monitoring, rapid deployment. What does it mean? All these things. To be fair, most of these things are not for microservices itself. You should be doing most of them if you're doing monolith or any kind of development. But you can get going without them on a monolith or a normal system. You cannot get going in a distributed system. If you don't have this, you will fail. So we're going to talk on a few topics that I think are interesting. One of them is inter-process communication. So we have two types of communication, synchronous and asynchronous, one-to-one -one and one-to-many. Okay? Um, who uses a REST API for, to communicate with the backends, the frontends? Okay. Who uses uh, messaging systems? Poopso? Okay, cool, a few. Good. So, as an analogy, uh, most of the synchronous requests are I call you. So, I pick one phone, I call you, you have to be there, you have to pick the phone, we exchange information, and it's done. That has a huge problem. Both of us have to be there to pick up the phone. That's why we invented WhatsApp, which is a synchronous communication. If it's one to one, I put you a request. When you have time, you look it up, you reply, I get a response. One to many is one of those channels that we share with a lot of people. A lot of stuff going there, maybe you care, maybe you don't care. Okay? But that is the concept. So, independently of what do you choose, you need to do an API design first. That includes even monoliths, but it's fairly important. Before you develop anything, do your contracts, define them, be careful with your versioning. If you break things, change your version. You should have testing and everything that checks that your APIs are consistent. Which is easy for, it's, uh, for REST APIs, it's not that easy for messaging APIs. This looks very obvious, but there, there's two types, text-based and binary-based. Probably most of you, most of our projects use JSON-based communication, REST APIs. Why? Anyone want to tell me why? Simple. Simple? True, but there are many others for the other one. But one important thing is that humans can read it. Uh, that's very important. <laughs> so you basically get a message, you go to a, a browser, you put something, enter, you get it back and say, oh, I'm getting two books and stuff like that. You can read it, but they're worse than binary based, like protocol buffers and Avro and stuff like that. So binary is more efficient by far. You can see the numbers, they're amazing, but 
you cannot read it as a human. So we tend to fall to the things that are simple. We, we do choose, as engineers, to choose simple things that work for us instead of more complicated ones that even are better because it is not worth it. So who uses REST here? You told me most of you. It has a lot of pros. It's simple. You can test a CFA uh, API from a browser. It support, support, support reply out of the box. It's uh, firewall friendly. For example, protocol buffers sometimes are not uh, firewall friendly. Uh, it doesn't require any intermediate thing. You call something, you get back an answer. Cons, it only supports uh, request reply. It's true that you can do some tricks like don't pull in, get back stuff. Um, Reuse availability, both of them need to be up at the same time. This is very, very important. We give it for granted. What if the whole thing goes down? Imagine that you're selling things. You place an order, and if the order service is not up, you miss that order. So you lose budget, you lose money. That's not acceptable in many places. If you have all those systems, you can keep it. Clients might know the locations. You should know where that thing is, or you need a dis uh, discover service. Fetching multiple resources is quite challenging. So you know that you can get 10 books, but what if I want two books, three apples, four oranges, and stuff like that? It's not made for that. It's not thought of that. And it's sometimes difficult to map operations to HTTP verbs. Uh, who of you use an API? Do you use a REST API that supports the four verbs? Update, create, delete, all that? All of you? Okay, good. You are in the highest level of the, well, not highest, uh, maturity level three. So for four, you actually then you need to give a URL to how to move to the next thing. But there's sometimes that create and update is not enough. Like if I create an order, I do create order, perfect. But what if I want to cancel an order? Is that a delete? Is that an update? Is a refund? So is there a refund there? No, there isn't. So there's some operations that do not match HTTP. So it has limitations. What we can do, otherwise, messaging. So messaging, we send messages, WhatsApp, stuff like that. But we have to find uh, a standard way. So we have documents, which is data. We have comments, which is what I want to do, the operation I want to perform. And this is text, so you can say anything. I want to refund my order. I want to upgrade my teddy bear to a bigger one. Whatever is important for your business. And events. Events is something happened, I get an event. Something happened, I get an event. And that's the way you can coordinate many systems. Okay, so this is how it looks. Uh, basically, you do have these two new things, which are channels. Okay, this is like a request reply, but with channels. So if these things go down, the message can still be here. If this thing goes down, the message can still be here. So it has some benefits, but you have the complexity of how the messages look like, how do I receive them, how do I know if I receive them, ah, stuff. You can do it without uh, a message broker. So each of these your service, your backend systems can call each other with messages. But if they fall, well, you miss the message. With a message broker, perfect. It can actually buffer, keep them, do queues, whatever. But the main problem is that it's a single point of failure. So this is the message broker and message communication. It's loose coupling, can allow message buffering, flexible communication. I mean, a lot of benefits. Problems is that it has bottleneck. Like if it goes slow, it's super slow. If it breaks, everything breaks. And it has complexity. Now you have to maintain a thing that before you didn't have. So that means another thing in your head. OK? So, so far, so good. What do you think about uh, messaging? Think it's better? It's worse? Depends? What? Depends. Oh, wonderful <laughs> answer. Uh, one thing important, and when you change some of these and you will, it will, the first time that I saw this, it made sense, but it broke my head. So you have three, five systems. Each of them they have an SLA of 99% to keep it simple. And then because you go to microservices and now they're in five different points, even if each of them have a 99, you have to call five because math, you now have a 95% of SLA. So that's very important to keep in your head because you have more possibilities of failure. So statistically, you're more likely to have problems. And that, that is something that you might not even sign. Okay, so how do we mitigate all the problems that will come with this? With transaction and sagas. So first of all, any questions? Follow-ups, challenge? No? Boost? Cheers? 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 There you go. So let's put a problem. So somebody wants to purchase a teddy bear. You know, this lovely thing. Good. Uh, how do you ensure that it's saved in a monolith? And um, what if it fails? How do you do this normally? 
Anyway, very simple question. So you, I want to purchase. What do I do? Cool. But in a database, what do we do? You do a, an acquire, you know, some sort of. Exactly. Uh, so it's as simple as this. You have a transaction. You check if there's enough quantity. If there's enough quantity, I made a purchase. If it fails, roll back. It's so cool. It's so simple. Well, you, you cannot have that anymore. <laughs> because now it's two systems. It's three systems, so you cannot roll back. That was easy. And it's still, we failed on that one. Imagine that you cannot do that anymore. So how do you do this with Sagas? Sagas is basically how to maintain this data consistency across multiple services. And how we do that? We, we basically coordinate them. OK? So order service now creates an order, and it keeps it as approval pending. So an order has now intermediate states. It doesn't go from not done to done. Now it needs to be on like, oh, I think I'm being going good, but I'm not going to confirm. Then another service checks if there's enough stock. Then the fulfillment service says, yeah, the order is good, I'll create a ticket. The payment service says, yes, this is paid. And then the order service changes to its approved. Okay, so now we have a lot of steps. In Sagas, the way to actually make a rollback is we have a transaction, and we need a compensating transaction. Because these things can happen in any order. And then it becomes very difficult to do. Some of this makes sense, so I have an object, I can create it, I can reject it. I can create a ticket, I can reject it. I can charge amount, I can refund amount. But what happens if all of them happen at different orders? You have a problem. So, you have two ways of doing it. One of them is choreography. I think it's pretty cool. Okay. Um, what is choreography? So there's no central coordination. Basically, each of the services have to listen and react to whatever happens. So what is this process? It's very simple. It has some loose coupling. I only listen to the things that I need. Uh, cons, well, it's difficult to understand. You go into a service and you have so many entry points from different services, and you might not even know where they come from. Uh, you can have cyclic dependency, and you can start coupling your services to events, which you never want. What is the other probability? Orchestration. So basically, this guy over here says what other people need to do. So we build a piece of code an orchestrator, which actually is responsible for the SAG. So it's basically a piece of code that we call orchestrator that says, I'm going to call you, you tell me what is going on, if it's good, I'm going to call you, then I'm going to call you, and if it fails, I will apply on the people that I already went this compensation transaction. Okay, so I'll roll back each of the services to the point they should be. Simple dependencies, uh, less coupling, because only the orchestrator, if it's me, know about the three of you, but you don't know what the, between them, you don't know each other, which is fine, no? There's a risk of centralizing because I'm now the owner of that thing and it can grow. And if whenever we developers have a place with a thing, it's together, we tend to put everything there because it's super simple, then again, it's unmaintainable, and we basically destroy ourselves. Cool! Everybody knows this? Who knows this? Yeah, come on, come on. Yeah, even if you don't know, I don't care anymore. Uh, <laughs> Now, this is, this is fairly standard. So this is what is expected from a transaction. Uh, why it's important? Uh, because when you actually go to an ATM and you get money out of it, the banks wants to know that you got the money, and then you, that money goes out of your bank account. If we could not accept that, that would be problematic. Like, do I have the money? Do I have the money? You will get pretty pissed off if you go to an ATM with their money, and you don't get the money, but actually your account goes down. So you do care. Everybody cares about this. It needs to be atomic, so it happens or doesn't happen. It needs to be consistent. When it happens, it cannot go back. It needs to have isolation, like if a lot of people do many things, they should not collide. If you take money out of the ATM and I take money out of the ATM, it should not matter. And it should stay for time. No? That's why we made uh, databases. That's why we made transactions, and they work. In Microsoft's world, it's very important to understand that you lose this. There is no isolation, and this is very important. There is no isolation. Many things can happen at the same time. You cannot control them anymore, and this is a big problem. So you might have something that is not acceptable to lose this. That makes sense. You can lose updates. Uh, you can have dirty reads and non-repeatable reads. So I read something, then I want back, and some, you change it. It's a three. I, I want to put a four but someone comes, put a 5, but I'm going to put my 4. So your 5 is lost. 
already read a three, I go back, now it's a four, but I haven't read it, so I put a five, it should be a six. All these things can happen, okay? This is pretty bad. So there are countermeasures, but you have to build them. Semantic block, you saw it. So we don't go from one state to another, we go to intermediate states. An order is pending and it goes through proof. We do commutative operations whenever we can. Credit debit, like if I get three, uh, three dirhams, I can give you back three dirhams. And then if I do this, that's perfect. But the uh, business needs to understand that an account can go to minus 20. And maybe sometimes it's acceptable, maybe sometimes it's not. Because the goal will basically get credit. Uh, read the value, you can be positive, I mean there are many, many strategies, but basically it's the data has changed, then I don't do anything. There's versions, like if the version of the data has changed, I'm out. What if it's uh, very risky? Then don't use sex, use distributed transactions. There might be places where it's not acceptable that even with these countermeasures, there's still a chance that something happened. Then you use distributed databases that accept distributed transactions, they're very specific, like MySQL, there are many solutions, they're paid, they're expensive, uh, but they are the only ones that I tell you, yes, you can do this, and this is where databases become important. I love, no, I love uh, MongoDB, yes, but it doesn't have consistency. Is that okay with you? Yes or no? So it depends. So far, so good. Any questions? You can ask, no? Okay, more or less, this is seven sourcing. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very accurate description, it should be in books. Um, messages, Go to something called a channel. They can be there, they can be lost, they can be different sizes, it can be a mess. So how will we do this? Uh, this, is very, this is interesting. Uh, we're so used to table our data, so used to this concept. Anybody uses another thing that is not this? Does anybody use a graph database, for example? No? Okay. So most of you use some database like this, no? So you think of tables, rows, and values. That's great, it, it have, it's been working for years, and it works for many, many stuff. Um, but there's some problems, like the relational thing, it's not fully, you don't have that connection. And what is very, very important is when you make a change on a table, on this row, if I change this number to one, can I, can I know what number was before? It's gone. That is crazy. Like. How we how we did accept that? We went to uni, they said, yeah, you changed that and that's good. Oh no, that's not good. So I cannot go back. I don't know what happened. Maybe you work in a, if you're actually thinking of microservices, you're probably in an industry or complexity that you would need some sort of audit. You would need to know when something happened to one to two, and you should be able to roll back or no. Then you usually create your own database to actually maintain the logging, and then it becomes even more complex and your model is as complex as microservices with other problems. And this is how it looks with all the events. Like a lot of systems sending messages that changes many things across many places and are very difficult to follow. So basically what we're talking about is if we use this event sourcing, we can reliably know that we publish going events. So when something happens, I publish this change. When something changes, I publish it has changed. It can preserve the history of aggregates. What that mean is I don't, I don't save a snapshot of how the data it is. What I have is a list of events. So I can execute my list of events and I can be on a state. Is that understood? A sample will help? Do you want a sample? Someone? Okay. Imagine that I have the, so we sell these toys, okay? We sell these teddy bears. And we sold, to each of us we bought a teddy bear, a big one, super nice. And 15 days later, a uh, business person comes and says, you know, for every single teddy bear that we sold, uh, we want to give a chocolate. And you say, cool, what the usual way to work. So you make your business, you push it, and now every new person that buys a teddy bear will get a chocolate. But what happened with the person that already bought it? You got nothing. But if you have events, so you keep all the events, every time someone purchases a teddy bear, you keep it on a database like it's a a history, you know, a log. It's like a log. Think of a log uh, of events. And then you can go back in time and say, I'm going to apply the business logic a month back. Everyone that purchased a teddy bear will not get chocolate. Which is a good example, but it's, it's a concept like now you can work in time. You can work past. You can apply things to the things that happen and stuff like that. Maybe time thing, I guess. Um, 
the time machine. Time machine concept is amazing, and you have it in some uh, front-end technologies like React. Uh, the time machine for React events is super cool. Check it out. I think it's one of the best things. Back this uh, so React time machine actually uh, starts with backend time machine because it's very important. Uh, Cons is different change. Uh, it's a different mindset. It has some complexity. Evolving events can be tricky. You know when you have to migrate one database to another and you made a change on a database, or you have to migrate this whole thing to another thing. It's a pain. Usually you're super scared, you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, same, ha same thing happened with events. Your event was like this, now it changed. Now you have to go back to your old your events and fix them and migrate them. Similar problems. Deleting data is tricky because deleting is not deleting. Deleting is actually publishing an event that says this is no longer valid or this doesn't exist. So there is a point in time where that thing exists and there is a point in time where that thing doesn't exist. But if you miss that event, it will not be deleted. Okay, so it's, it's quite different. And querying event store is super challenging. You cannot query anymore. Can you give me the number of things that I have here? It's, it's not possible. Uh, but that way to mitigating. So we're going to talk about that. How to query data. So first are good. Questions? You sure? Booze? Tears? Wow, sometimes, sometimes I say a booze. Uh, but it's fine. Uh, so querying data. This is something that everybody knows. It's very simple. So if you have a monolith or one database, uh, your data is in one place. So quite simple to get data. Uh, so you want to say, can I get my previous orders given a keyword? So can I get all the teddy bears that I bought and that are red? Uh, yeah, last year. That's possible. You make a query, you get it back. Cool. So how does it look in a monolith? Yeah, cool. I can do that. Give me 10 minutes. I'll give you the query and that's the result. Uh, I'm going to do a microservice. Can I do it? Yes, yes. No, actually I can't. Um, it's very difficult, okay? So before you had this uh, one place to go, but now you want to see like your orders. You have to call this service. Can I get the orders that I met? Uh, this is actually from a food sample kitchen stuff. Uh, can I get my tickets from the kitchen? Can I see what was delivered? But the problem is like you can actually not get from a content service or purchases you cannot make a query for a, if it's brown because this service never took into account that you wanted to know if the teddy bear was brown. A content service is about money. They don't care. So you gotta do it. Um, so something, even, even things that do not span through multiple services like find available toy stores, uh, it's not that simple. Like has that database the geospatial capability? Maybe it doesn't. And ownership, and this is very important, now we talk about this, it's not that simple to divide things. Who do you think it should own the ability to know the available toy stores? Okay, this is just to not uh, use food, but let's use food because it's simple. Um, I want to order food, so I need to know which restaurants are open around me that can give me food. Who do you think should handle that query? The service for restaurants? They know when the restaurants are open, they know where the restaurants are. Or should be the order service? And now we have to pick one of those. So, restaurants? Okay, restaurant service. Order service? Okay, there are options for both, but usually it will be the order service because the restaurant service cares about the owners of the restaurants, like your menu, uh, how much money you make, and it's a type of service that has non critical queries. Instead, knowing which restaurants are open is a critical query. It's basically used at lunch and at dinner huge amount of times. So you need to scale that incredible. So you want that to be
But you don't want to make those queries in your query database. If you do analytic queries in your production database, you're screwing yourself because they're usually very heavy. And then it blocks your database from important things like selling toys. Um, it makes possible querying basically, it uh, approves separation of concerns, but it has some important problems. It's more complex, and that is lag. You might be querying data that is old. Because if you haven't received it, then it has to not be processed, and you have to be okay with that. And that is very important. And the moment that people, like your business will ask you, how do we fix this? You say, well, we can do this. But you have to tell them, but they cannot not be updated. And people will freak out. Because they say, oh, no, but I want the latest data. And you have to prove that actually that's not true. And for each case, that might differ. Might differ. So you may need to do composition, and in some cases, you might need to do this. So, because of time limitation, and it's a very complex topic, I have many things that I'm going to go super fast, and then we can go to questions. ABI patterns include all this, which is basically you build all of this microservices out of that, and you have here like a bower, and you have to go through the bower to get to the microservices. And you'll have to think about all these things security, authentication, authentication, the limits, caching, many, many things that used to be in one place. So if you do a Spring Boot solution monolith, you basically can check is the session valid and you're good to go. When you have 10 services, you cannot do that anymore. So your API gateway should check if the authorization is valid, and then probably with a JWT token or something like that, check if you are able to do that, whatever you want to do in a different service. But it gets very difficult. You can build back and front ends, you need to have legacy support because you're going to change the whole thing to microservices. And this is very important. How do you do this? How do you take a monolith? From a monolith to microservices, and this is very important, you do not build microservices. You usually build a monolith, and then you take pieces out of the monolith as microservices. If you start building microservices, probably something's wrong. It's very unlikely that you start with something like that. No one starts with a startup of 20 million people consuming from the get go. If you do, maybe you quit. Uh, but it's very, so usually you take this. Um, and this is very important. So you have to actually put up your API gateway how to support old parts and new parts and how to communicate them. And usually you might have to build bridges between them. Deployment. Deployment gets more difficult. Deployment needs to be automatic, deployment needs to be isolated. This happens also with monoliths. If you have monolith and you cannot deploy with one simple command, you're doing wrong already. But in microservices world, you cannot spend the time of spawning 25 services just to test one thing. They need to be everything automated. You need to uh, go on top of the tool. So there's two types of deployments, not very specific. This means I have a Spring Boot, so it works on Java, so I have a machine. I go to Amazon, I make my machine, I install Java, and it works. Virtual machine is I have this machine already like in an image, and then I use it to put my code. Containers, Docker, stuff like that. So you define now your machines as a configuration file. Serverless goes even farther, and this is great. If you can, use as much as you can. You put your function in Lambda, for example, in AWS, or Google Cloud, they have the same thing, and you call the function or it, it basically subscribe to events. There is no machine behind that, no provisioning. That's much better. Learn Kubernetes, uh, learn service mesh, and deployment patterns. So all this are full topics, like it will take each of them an hour. So it's, it's, it gets difficult. Production readiness, so are you ready to go? Ah, oh, yeah. Ah, you want to take a picture, but I, I'm gonna share the slides, it's, it's much better. Uh, <laughs> And we were seeing uh, SpongeBob. Um, so production readiness, I mean, there's so many things that you have to check. Like, are you ready for what the trip you're trying to go? It's a very long game, actually. Um, so are they secure? Can you configure them on the go? Each of them needs to have a configuration. Can you change the configuration without touching your code? Your code should not know about your machines. Your code should not know where other services are. Your code should be quite stupid. And it should use other things to give that information. Like you should never know the URL of your database. That is nuts. Okay? Because then if you do production, 
testing, environments, all the things that you will need to go to this level, you will not hit them. Uh, observability. <laughs> now you don't have one service that you can query and see how it's going. What if one of your 20 services is down? You need to know. And they need to be able to recover themselves. They need to have health APIs. And those health APIs include readiness APIs. Uh, log aggregation. Your logs now are all spread. You need a way to actually collect them and join them in one session. You should be able to read what happened to one person or one trace with the whole thing. But it's traceability. Exception tracking, application metrics, audit logging, all that becomes way more difficult. And there's more topics like testing and other stuff, but uh, there's a limitation in time. Also, this is the first time I gave this talk, so please give me feedback. If it was not interesting, interesting, or you should have to use that, or we want more gifts, and stuff like that. Um, so, you have any question? Feel free. There's no, yeah.